You're listening to the Food and Fitness Podcast, the show about all things related to food and fitness. Follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at food.fitnesspodcast. We are your hosts, Jess White, Jackie Vandertoon, and Dave Marshall. On today's podcast, we have local organic farmer Jamie Richards from Ambre Farm joining us. Ambre Farm is dedicated to providing locally grown vegetables and eggs using organically sustainable methods. Jamie strives to increase soil fertility, lower his carbon footprint, and build a strong, vibrant local agricultural economy and communities, not only here, but throughout the world. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us. I understand it is the end of April when we're doing this podcast and you must be super busy in the field. So again, thank you so much for, for giving your time today. Before we get started, can you share with us how you got started in organic farming and your movement to regenerative agriculture? Um, well, I, I basically got into it um, because of a health issue. Um, I was eating apples a number of times and I kept having an allergic reaction and I couldn't figure out why. I went to the doctor and he simply said, well, maybe you better not eat them anymore. And I thought, okay, but it's kind of nice to have an apple or fruit of any type. And I realized it must be something that was on the, uh, uh, that was sprayed on the, uh, on the fruit. Um, so I said, well, <laughs> If that's going to be what's going to happen to me when I eat stuff that's sprayed, maybe I better learn how to grow um, food without doing that. I, I had a backyard garden at that point. I wasn't uh, using a lot of chemicals or anything like that, but I, but I also saw nothing wrong with it. But after those uh, three trips to the emergency work board, um, I realized that this isn't good for me. So that's when I decided that I needed to learn how to grow things organically. Um, it wasn't uh, until it, my garden gradually grew from backyard garden to a large commercial enterprise where when you try to become organic, um, there's a lot of challenges, but that, that sort of led me into um, that path. So I'm not ideological um, about organic. Um, it came from a basically a health perspective on my point. So, but what I have found is that by doing it, um, it's fairly easy to grow good, healthy food. And I think my customers enjoy it. And I know I do. And uh, it takes that worry of, you know, food sensitivity out of my life and hopefully for the, some of my customers too. Can, can I just ask you a quick question? Do you feel mm -hmm. better? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the things, if you teach kids how to um, grow kale, you'll eat kale. That's true for adults too. Um, so as, uh, as, as I've done this for 25 years, um, almost every vegetable that I would have looked at as a younger child would have gone, um, I eat. So, you know, we're kind of blessed when we go shopping, we literally go out the door and pick our dinner and, uh, you know, it's a really great way to live. And, and, and my health has been relatively good. I mean, as good as anybody for, uh, at my age, so I'm pretty, uh, whether food's important, I'm not sure, but I think it's a huge component of, of keeping us healthy, obviously. I think it's so funny that you say, um, you know, what, what you didn't like as a kid, you love as an adult. And I think that so resonates with me because as a kid, I hated Brussels sprouts. And now that is my favorite vegetable. And I think yes. um, the more that you grow your own food and the more that you educate yourself in what you're eating, um, you just have a different appreciation for your vegetables and food in general. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So other than Brussels sprouts, are there some other items that maybe you didn't like, but now you're quite a big fan of? Uh, well, I would, I agree with Jess. I, I hated Brussels sprouts. I used to hide them in the uh, potato skins. So my mother wouldn't know that I didn't eat them. Uh <laughs> and I know that probably wasn't very effective. Um, yeah, beets. Uh, you know, I was never fond of beets. Um, uh, basically, I, let, let's maybe do it the simple way, uh, David, is that um, apparently, asking my mother, I like corn. Okay. And, and, that, and now, I, now I eat pretty well like every type of vegetable known, known in the world, you know, so it's kind of neat. And, and, and my mother, actually, who is, uh, you know, she's 87 and uh, in a long-term care facility now, and we had a good talk. Um, just she was laughing. She's I just can't believe I used to worry so much 
that you wouldn't eat your vegetables. And, and now, look, you're a vegetable farmer. And she was chuckling about that. So it was kind of a fun conversation. That's awesome. Jamie, can you define regenerative uh, farming for us, regenerative agri agriculture? Okay. Um, yeah. Like organic, the, the focus of organic should be, in, and maybe it's strayed over the last bunch of years as the big corporations have sort of taken it over, but organic was always focused on the soil. And, and I have found that if your soil is good and healthy, you don't have pests, you don't have diseases, um, and all those problems disappear, but it's really getting the soil um, perfect. It's, organic is not about not um, spraying pesticides or herbicides. It really should be about what you should be doing. And so as I moved into regenerative agriculture, what I loved about regenerative agriculture, it's basically a full list of things you should do rather than things you shouldn't do. And so um, it focuses on soil. And uh, um, at first I was sort of priding myself that I was, oh, I'm a good organic grower. But then I started really looking at myself critically and saying, hey, you know what? Uh, am I improving the soil? Like really substantially long-term improving the soil. And so that's where I decided that what I need to do is to get more carbon in the soil. So I don't wanna go too deep into regenerative agriculture unless you want me to. But by putting more carbon in the soil, you increase the biological activity in the soil. So all the bacteria and the fungi, all the things that uh, keep the soil alive and free up the nutrients for the plants. That's what regenerative agriculture is all about, putting carbon in the soil. And there's lots of good other reasons to do it, but what it does is it makes your soil come alive. So um, I often think about you know, people always ask me, have you done a soil test? And I go, well, that's chemistry. But I know that if you get your biology right, if you get lots of uh, biological life in the soil, then um, the stuff that grows on top of the soil is going to be fine. So that's my theory. And, I, and it seems to work. Thank you. So uh, right on the homepage of your website, uh, it comes up there, real food, real fresh, real local. And I enjoy buying local. I've purchased from uh, your products multiple times through the little farm store uh, out front, uh, your products, the other products that you feature there. Um, and it's just, I love knowing that what I'm buying uh, is grown locally and from someone who takes such pride uh, in their work, their soil and the product that they produce. So that's something that I see as real food, but what would you define uh, real food as for yourself? Well, I think you've done, you've, you've basically, your definition, I have no quibble with it at all. It's a perfect definition. Um, and something about, I think the key is with real is it's local and it's fresh. And, and in a sense, those two ideas really have to come together because it's tough to have something fresh that's coming from thousands of kilometers away. And, and so we know that once we pick a crop, that it's starting its decomposition process really, you know, and we want to eat it as quickly as we can to get the maximum nutrients and the flavor out of that vegetable. And so local is sort of the thing that, that, that holds that together. So I, I think the idea of real food is, is that sense that you taste something and it, it tastes really good and, and you know it's really fresh and they, they sort of go together as you know a, a package I guess so that's what I think I mean by real food because um, you go in you know you go into the grocery store in, in January and you see these luscious looking strawberries like they're big and they're shiny but you know you, you buy one and it kind of it has the promise of a strawberry but it's something different than what you would have gotten if you had gone to a pick your own you know in June in Dufferin County it just it, 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 it's the same thing, but it's not. And yeah. so, you know, I, and so I think just taking what you said and kind of going a little bit farther, what's the, what's the experience of eating it? And I think, you know, you, you kind of know, when you, well, this is really good. And, you know, you taste a carrot and you go, this tastes amazing compared to the carrots you can buy, um, you know, coming from Mexico, for example. So it, I think taste is probably the, the big thing and, and the freshness, and they're, they're, they're totally connected. So. so if someone is trying to get real food but may not live in Dufferin County, what would you say is the best way for them to find it 
or to find someone who does a, a project similar to yours? Well, there's a, you know, there's a number of us, us uh, stubborn people who are running small little farms around. And, you know, um, there's enough of them that if you actually decide to support them, um, a large number of people could actually be fed by them. Like, I mean, I market a little bit. I don't want to be that big, but you know, there's lots of people that could come and we could feed them. I mean, I could, I could grow more food if that's, you know, and I think so, so by people starting to find their local farmer, then you create a, a more vibrant business for us. And then we can grow more and you get some economies of scale and you hire your workers and, and it, it sort of starts to make a little more sense economically. Um, if you look at Statistics Canada, for example, small farms need to be grossing at least about $100,000 a year. And if you don't, it's really hard to make ends meet. And so you see lots of young, you know, idealistic couples come out of university or college and they can't make a go of it because they can't get to that number. So that's where we need to have the, the local support to try to find those. Now, um, you know, In the Hills puts a map out at an online uh, web source and many communities do now. And so you got to find those local farmers and try to support them. And sometimes you're going to walk into my shop and go, oh, not too much today, but have faith because, you know, it, it is hard to, to provide food across the board 12 months of the year. And so there's a bit of a mind shift that customers have to have. It's not a grocery store. And yet, if you come regularly enough and you build up that sort of um, relationship with your local grower, whether it be me or anybody else, then it helps us take care of you guys. So I think it's sort of that chicken egg thing, you know, how do we make it grow? And we have to support the people that we can. And it'll be amazing when that, that starts to happen. Yeah, and there is nothing better than your fresh local veggies. Um, but what's, what's your take on um, frozen and canned food? Because in Canada, you can't eat fresh asparagus from Ontario all year yeah. round. Um, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on fresh and local, but frozen? Well, I, I guess, I mean, we freeze large chunks of our food at a personal level, um, for, um, our consumption all year round. So no problem with that. In fact, if you have the freezer space and you've learned how to do some food preservation, which is a great skill, whether it be canning or freezing, um, you can buy stuff at the farmer's markets when it's cheap and put, put food away. But that's a skill that needs to probably be recultivated. Um, you know, people have forgotten, they don't know how to do it. Their grandparents maybe did it. So I think it's great because that's what we used to do, right? Mm -hmm. We used to be able to set aside a lot, a large amount of food. And at the same time, um, you know, I've been trying to grow year round uh, with no heat um, and I've been relatively successful. I mean, from an intellectual point of view, I've achieved it. I can't quite meet demand, but if you come into my shop in the middle of January, there's not only storage vegetables, but there's also uh, vegetables that I've actually picked fresh from the greenhouses. That's amazing. It's kind of cool. Because there's about 20 different vegetables you can actually grow in Ontario in an unheated greenhouse, which most people mm -hmm. find really wild, but... You can. That's something I've just learned today. That's fantastic. Yeah. So for example, like we plant our spinach in September and we have a movable greenhouse, which you, I don't know if you've ever toured the farm, David, but you're welcome to have a look at it. Actually, we plant it in September, it's outside and we move the greenhouse over top of the spinach bed. And that's where it sits. We harvest in November, December, January, February, March, and we're just finishing up our spinach out of that greenhouse now. Every week we go pick some more. And it keeps on producing. And we fed the heat not on all that time. It just is hardy. It just protected enough. It keeps growing. And so that's kind of cool. Um, and sometimes we leave stuff that we forget. We just didn't get it harvested. I, I had uh, lettuce in the greenhouse and it was unheated. And I, it was, wasn't big enough to harvest. And in November and December, we just left it. And we're going, oh, look, it's survived the winter. <laughs> So it is surprising what survives, actually. I find that actually amazing because I had onions that weren't left over that we didn't pick last year. And guess what's growing? 
yeah. onions are growing again in my garden and I didn't, and, and we didn't expect them to grow again. So that is, that's really super encouraging. Yeah. Um, and go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say in past times, people would throw straw on and stuff to protect those crops. So they actually had some food at this time of year, because, you know, you go back a hundred years, 150 years, it was, this was a hungry time for people. Like, we aren't living in the world we live in now. So if they could pull out some carrots out of the ground that were still okay, they would eat them. Uh, thanks, David. I'm having some internet issues, so I'm hoping you can still hear me. Can we talk a little bit about pests, weeds, and diseases? Um, I love how you talked about carbon and bacteria, which I find fascinating. How can we work with, and I'm going to air quote pest weeds uh, and obviously diseases, I'm not going to air quote, but how can we work with nature to manage these things? Um, well, I, I think it's no different than how do we achieve our health. And I think we know that if, if we can sleep regularly, get the right amount of sleep, and we can eat the right amount of food, we can manage our stress, and we can get some exercise, we almost never get sick or we don't get sick as often. And, and I think we all know that, you know, you got a big deadline and you're burning the, burning the candle at both ends and sure enough, you get a cold or, you know, you, you're the big Christmas rush. And then right after Christmas, you're going, Oh, I'm just getting sick because you, you just haven't been taking care of yourself or you had too much chocolate. But anyways, you, and I think that basic principle is that we know what we have to do to stay healthy. And then you just back this, up. So what do plants need to stay healthy? Well, they need exactly the same things that we do. Now, it's my job as a farmer to figure out what those needs are and provide them. And, you know, there's two approaches now at that point. One, you can pour nutrients on it. You can pour, you know, the, uh, things to control the pests and all that stuff. And it will work. You will get a problem. Um, or you can say, I wonder how it would grow naturally. And when you walk into a forest or any natural area, um, it, you know, na nature's working okay. You know, and there's <laughs> it, it, generally speaking, you know, it's in balance and sometimes it gets out of balance, but in the long term, there's balance. And so how do you achieve that? And so with regenerative agriculture, they say, don't disturb the soil. So in other words, don't row the tail or plow the soil all the time. Because when you do that, you disturb all the uh, linkages that are actually existing in terms of the biotic connections. And so don't do it. Because you know, forests are fine. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, fertilizing a forest, right? And if there are as a pest invasion, eventually there'll be uh, other insects will come and eat those other insects or whatever, the birds will come and they'll take care of it and bring it into balance. So it's really getting things in harmony. And uh, it takes about five years. And I know the first five years when I was farming at a very large scale, it was a nightmare. I mean, it was, it was like a horrendous uh, horror movie of what could possibly go wrong because it, I'd be looking up in my encyclopedia of pest diseases and, oh, what's that, what's that, what's that? And I'd lay in bed going, oh, what am I gonna do? And then eventually I realized that really I had to get my soil better. And just a little story, I guess, to explain how significant it is. And you have to almost see it to believe it. But we have chickens out in the pasture and little movable chicken coops. Maybe you've heard about these things. They're called chicken tractors. Anyways, we move them every day. They eat all the bugs, eat the weeds, and they poop. Um, and over time, of course, that area becomes incredibly rich because, um, you know, there's a lot of fertilizer there, but also the bugs and stuff have been, you know, controlled a little bit by the, by the, by the chickens. And then what we often do is we say, okay, let's turn this area into a garden because we know it's rich and it's time to, to do the transition between the old garden to the new garden. And we did that one year and it turned out that the following year when we planted our potatoes, half the potato row was in that area that where the chickens were. And the other half was in the old garden still. And we had composted that and done all the, the right organic things. 
And then there was this little strip in the middle between those two sections that was kind of disturbed and, and rough and not very good. So we put a whole row of potatoes in and literally um, the potatoes where the chicken tractors were, you could see they were about two feet higher. They were dark, dark green. Then we got to the disturbed little strip and they were little scrawny little potatoes and they, they were kind of a lime green or a light green. And then the next part was where we had composted and it was kind of half as high. And, and so you go, okay, wonder what's gonna, go, what's gonna happen there? And of course, if you've ever grown potatoes and if you have a home garden, you know, potato beetles are the nemesis of anybody trying to grow potatoes. And lo and behold, there were no potato beetles on that rich lush area. Really? There was a few potato beetles on the composted area. And in the area that was disturbed, it was like potato beetle city. It was like everywhere. And so you're going, okay, check, get your soil right and you have no pests. And it's mind blowing until you see it, you can't believe it. And so it's always nice when you do kind of an experiment, you didn't need to do an experiment, but you find out. But then we, and often what happens is there's always a concern from a farming point of view. If you get all this top growth, what's going on underground? What are your potatoes going to be like? Because sometimes all the energy goes into the plant. But when we dug up the potatoes, um, you know, they were the size of your hand. They were a pound each. Now, it's tough to sell them that way in a little basket <laughs> because you get one potato per basket, but unbelievable. And so I, I that that's a lesson i guess you know that's a lesson on fertility and that's what you got to do you just let the animals take care of things which regenerative agriculture talks about is you work animals into your rotation get your soil right don't disturb it and boy unbelievable so i should videotape that someday you know when that happens again so people can actually believe it it, it once you see it you'll never doubt it ever again and so it's not like I'm a hippie guy, organic guy. This is just practical, basic common sense that what makes things grow. That and it's not like you had to spend a ton of money on working that soil and a whole ton of effort. I mean, it was literally a byproduct of the chickens living all over top of that soil, which I think goes completely into the whole thing that you're talking about of just regenerative and using the tools at hand to do the work for you, but then it probably does better work than you, what you may have been able to do. <laughs> Absolutely. When you think of all the times that I've tried to throw my, myself at this and the ego at solving a problem. And it was like, Oh man, the answer was actually there right in front of me. I love it. So I, I can clearly tell that you're obscenely passionate about uh, the food and the way that you grow and uh, the products that you produce. Um, Thankfully, you've also been a huge sponsor of the Compass Run for Food. You've also been a racer in the Compass Run for Food, um, who's done pretty well, not just for your age group, but uh, overall, you've continuously done quite well. So uh, we're always proud of you to do that. But uh, what, what drives you to work within your community by taking profits out of your pocket, putting it into the, um, an organization like the Compass Run for Food, or taking product that you could retail and having that donated to the food bank, what, what makes you do that? Because not that's not something that everybody would do. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, to one of my favorite passages from the Bible would be Romans 12, which is really slaying out kind of, we all have our gifts. And we all need to do something. And we need to do something that we, we, are good at and it's good for our community. And well, <laughs> I can grow food and um, this is something that's important to do. So coming from a sort of a spiritual background, this is one of the reasons why I would do it. Um, and the other issue is food insecurity. Um, I've never not been hungry ever. Um, except in the odd camping trip when we didn't plan very well. But, you know, to, to have persistent hunger in your life, um, especially if you're a child, um, and I was a teacher, um, 
you, it, you're stacking so many things up against people of a, by not allowing a basic need to be met, which is food. Um, you know, you're setting them up for a lifetime of potential failure or not living up to their potential at the very least. And if I can do something about that, I got to do it. And so it really meshes with my sense of, you know, kind of the spiritual mission of Ambry Farm, but also the real pragmatic need of people and kids in our community. So it, it really speaks to me, um, food, um, because a well-fed body and mind can do amazing things. And if you're perpetually worried about your basic needs, you can't. And uh, so, so I guess that's what draws me to the Compass Run. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I do it. And I'm so happy I can do it. I'm glad that I can. And, uh, you know, I wish our bigger corporations would step up and do the same thing. Because if they generated, if they took my percentage of sales and dumped it into the community, we wouldn't have any problems in our yeah, for sure. We should put that on a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> so we are the food and fitness podcast. So I can't go without asking you because I know Compass Run for Food um, is huge about donating back to the to the community, but also uh, for running. So I know that you are a runner. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how that ties in with Ambre Farms at all? Um, yes, I think I can. I knew this question was coming because I suggested it would be a question. Yeah. <laughs> how am I, I going to answer this? Well, if, if you think about it, um, the ability to grow your own food is, is a really important thing. Um, and it, if, if you can't grow it, you can get a guy like me to grow it, and that's good too. But growing your own food is a tremendously important, powerful thing to do in a person's life. Um, and then the second part of it is you, if, if you can't grow your own food, um, then being concerned about what you're eating, thinking about what you're eating from a health point of view is really, really important because uh, what goes into your body is, is, is going to drive how, how you live. And then the, the third thing, thing in this continuum is, is you have a body and you need to exercise it. In our, in our world, we don't we tend not to have a, a life that we have a hunter and gatherer life anymore. We, we're in desks. We're doing our work at computers. Yeah. Uh, we kid, stick kids at school all day long. Um, I'm lucky. I have one of these crazy jobs that actually I'm walking around like crazy. Like I, I walked 22 kilometers yesterday, you know, um, about eight kilometers running and the rest was doing my job. So, you know, you get a tremendous amount of exercise, but by keeping active and healthy, um, it's, 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 it, it's sort of bringing your life to kind of some sort of fullness. Right. So I think those are the reasons why I, I, I decided to start running because for a number of years I didn't run. And then I realized I had a kind of a, an experience, I guess, when I was traveling with my family, we were in, in Morocco and we were on a hike and we were up at 2,400 meters above uh, sea level. And we had to hurry to, to, to meet a, a deadline and, and I looked over my son was up the hill not breathing hard my wife was doing the same thing and I'm out of breath I go wow you know because I was in my 50s then and I'm going really that's never happened to me before and so then I realized I need to take care of my body too even though I'm growing great food and I'm eating healthy um, I wasn't in good shape so that's when I re I started running again and so um, I, I think it's just part of the package food, fitness. I mean, this is why you came up with your podcast, right? There's a connection between it, but I think there's a deeper connection than just food and fitness. I think there's something about um, um, empowerment that's really important through all this because it's empowering people um, to do things that are good for them. <laughs> and so I think that's why I kind of got into running and I just enjoy it. I mean, it's a great stress relief um, and it's fun to compete when you're an old guy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> now, I have a question that has been in my mind, and I hope I'm not opening a can of worms by asking it, but I just have to know. Um, when it comes, and I know I know you're 
are, are you labeled as a regenerative regenerative farm? Is that like I'm not labeled as much anymore, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, regenerative. There is no real label for regenerative agriculture. It's sort of just uh, you open up any farming magazine and and it's you're going to find articles about it. And farmers are grappling with how do you do it. Uh, how can I do it well? How can I build it into my system? Um, the early research suggests it's profitable to do it, and that's what farmers like to hear. So there's no label for that. Organic has a label too, and you can get certified. Um, I did kind of walk away from that because um, that was a time when the bigger corporations were all moving toward certification. Um, and so now you, you go to Walmart, Zara's, any of the big stores, and, and they're all certified organic. Um, and once again, I, I, I started to realize every time I got certified, they really weren't asking about my soil. When they came to do my check, they wanted to look at my big pile of receipts. They didn't really look at my soil. And I'm going, you know what? That's not really important anymore. And I knew it wasn't. It has changed. There's been a bit of a co-opting uh, of the organic movement by big business. So like companies like Gay Lee, they'll have an organic line and they'll have a, a non-organic line. And, and, and so it's just part of their business model to make sure that they can sell to, to both segments of the market. And I kind of look at that and I get what they're doing from a business point of view. It makes sense for them. But I don't think that way because I'm kind of like this local guy that's trying to grow food that's really healthy. And I don't really want to get into, well, I got to have a segment for this market. Or I got to have a segment for this market because that's not driving me. And so I realized that my customers knew me well enough that it didn't matter. And our farm's like totally open. So like you guys tomorrow, if you want to come and wander around, you're welcome to. And it never has been a problem. And that's the best way, I think, the transparency and accountability of what we do um, is, is the most important thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there are some issues with labeling anything, I think, you know, because you end up with a bunch of rules and then you end up with lawyers and then you end up with a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Do you no, know, I, I, sorry, can, can I just ask, uh, you have courses in educational um, seminars, I'll call them for lack of a better word. I know we're in COVID right now. And it seems like you're not offering anything. Is this a, an avenue that you still want to continue to explore? Post yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty frustrated that we can't do it because I know that there's a zillion people who are now wanting to grow their own gardens and they could really benefit from some help and advice. And here I can't even offer a course to teach them how to do it. I could do it online, but I just feel it's a hard way to learn. So yes, I want to get that going up again, full on. Like last year we had, we snuck a course in uh, just in between the, the waves and uh, we got it done and, uh, and it was great. Um, and, you know, working with the adults, so they were really excited. They had their own, I have their own, they all have their own little gardens here. So they come and they learn and then they grow their little garden and each week, they come and then they learn a little more and they garden a little more. And so it's really great hands-on experience. So yeah, I'm ready to go. And I had a school group ready to go this year and we started and it got squashed because they couldn't come out to the farm legally. So I had to say, you can't. So they, they started their transplants at school and they had all their trays ready to go. And then of course we had to cancel it. But yeah, I want to get that going for kids and I get going for adults. And, and we're trying to also run some cool uh, just weekend experiences for adults. So like Phil from uh, Soul Life, for example, we've been talking about how we we're going to have a group of adults come. They're going to get a little tour of the farm. They're going to pick some produce. And then Phil is going to show them as a chef how to actually make something. So Love we'll it. have like a real hands-on sort of, and as you see, you're in, right? And so we want to do stuff like that, you know, to kind of create that local community, that connection between chef, farmer, and, and, and you guys. So yeah, we're ready to go. We've got an outdoor classroom built. You know, I got uh, the ads ready to go. Um, Just maybe has worked on them or should be working on them real soon. And we're ready to, <laughs> rock, we're, we're ready to rock and roll. I think, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hopeful that by um, July we might be able to get going again. It's amazing. But in, in yeah. The, yeah, sign us all up. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, what can people expect when they come to your farm? Um, like what's available? Yes. 
Okay. Um, well, right now we're in the heart of sort of our salad green, uh, leafy green stuff. So if you're a bunny rabbit, uh, you want to be here. Um, basically lots of green things. So our spinach and our kale and uh, uh, microgreens, pea shoots, salad greens, head lettuce, that sort of thing is like full on because it's coming out of the greenhouses and the greenhouses are kind of like two months early from what you would expect to be out of your backyard garden, right? Because if you have a backyard garden, you're not doing much yet, right? It's still, still not time. Mm -hmm. So um, that all that stuff's available. Now, also in our greenhouses, we have all our tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, all the warm weather crops are in and planted. Like our tomatoes are already, you know, this high and, uh, you know, not blossoming yet. Our peppers have blossoms, but don't have peppers on them yet. So they're, they're coming early, but uh, not till June before we start to see that sort of stuff. Um, and we also have, we've got, we've got a fair number of relationships with the local restaurants, um, especially when the pandemic hit last year. Um, of course, I lost 20% of my business immediately because they weren't buying vegetables. So I said, hey, what if I gave you the vegetables and you made stuff for me and we sell it here? And so it's actually become a very important part of our business, um, um, offering entrees and soups. And it's been super for them and me and the customers um, because it's kind of kept the restaurants going. And right now actually is like, this is the third lockdown. This is the worst lockdown for our local restaurants right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they need all the support they can get. Just toss that out to anybody who's gonna be watching the podcast. Um, whether they come here to buy a prepared meal or get a takeout because these guys are hanging and hopefully they can get through the next few weeks before, um, you know, before anything bad happens to them. But yeah. Um, so it's been really good to, to work this collaboration. And it's so cool because we've also been taking all the gnarly carrots, the carrots you pull out of the ground that look kind of funny ones you never see in the grocery store, <laughs> the ones that are crooked and bent and just, they look awful. A chef turns them into the most amazing things. Right. And so we're able to take some of the food that, you know, otherwise may not be sellable and they can turn it into something that's really healthy and, val and valuable. It's kind of cool. I think people need to know that ugly vegetables does not mean that it's less nutritious. There's not uh, just because it doesn't look good. doesn't mean that it's less nutritious or less valuable to you as a person, uh, to those who's consuming it. And definitely to those who are chefs, if you can get it, at a better price because it may not be available to or appeal to the mass market eyes. It's a great opportunity for you to make great produce at a reduced price, but you still get unbelievable produce that's grown locally. Yeah. And it's huge, you know, and, and we actually offer some of our products as holy uh, products are not perfect leaves and stuff like that. And we give them, we, we lower the price and people buy it because sometimes when we're growing something really well, like spinach and there's no holes in it, for many bugs, uh, people are going, well, where's the seconds? And going, well, sorry, it's going pretty well right now. I don't have any seconds for you. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it's perfectly healthy for us. And, uh, you know, it's once again, this is a grocery store model that has sort of affected how we view things. And that's not necessarily right or it's correct. And it's too bad. Um, and, and so a lot of food gets wasted because of that. And that's just really kind of a, a shame, especially when, people are hungry uh, mm -hmm. that shouldn't be happening and so it's a bottom line thing too like farms can like a market garden like mine the, the traditional losses of food would be 30 to 50 percent wastage yeah. which you have any business that you're running with a 30 to 50 percent loss um, couldn't succeed and yet here somehow it does um, but you know, the farmers aren't doing well because of it and, you know, it's food being wasted and that's not a good thing. So, yeah. So it's really important to not have food waste. I think one thing you, like you touched on earlier about talking about canning and preserving and freezing is like something that's lost. And I mean, when we were traveling out East, um, a lot of times out there, cellars was a huge thing, um, a, a while ago, but not something that's been used recently. So cold storage, but natural storage, but they said that a lot of times, um, people are going back into it now because they saw how beneficial using uh, a cellar like that is to retain like, you know, they're preserving vegetables or so their root vegetables. And I thought that was 
just so interesting how you could, yeah, continue to have fresh carrot, well, fresh carrots in your storage the whole time, or parsnips or rutabaga, potatoes, stuff like that. And it was like, it blew my mind just to see how people are going back to those kinds of ways. And you are seeing, um, you know, a lot of uh, people are getting more and more into canning. I mean, last, uh, I think the first lockdown that we had, it was impossible to find jars. Yeah, like was, you could yeah. not find them anywhere. Yeah. So, and it was like, I got in, I made mustard pickles uh, and jalapenos and stuff. And I loved it. And mm-hmm. I'm just, I wish I could do more. I wish I had more space to do more. I wish I had a commercial kitchen to do more. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. I mean, I think all these things, whether it's growing food, canning, preserving, um, even fixing some of your things in one generation, it can be lost, you know, and it's scary yeah. because like, I had grand, a grandfather that was always grilling me about gardening. And I'm, I'm sure that he played a huge influence. I mean, my dad couldn't grow much, but every time I went to visit my grandfather, uh, boy, it was really important for, you know, name these vegetables and he was talking about it. And, you know, I just took it in. Um, but if you don't have that link, gone. Yeah, and- that, That's so true. My, my grand, so I grew up on a, on a farm. So my with with my one grandfather so they always had a huge like half an acre sized garden and then my other grandfather um he lived in a rural no even when he lived in town wherever he went he always had half of his yard just gardens and I think that's made a huge impact on me I mean I don't have that large of a property so I'm a little bit more um like garden boxes and planter kind of gardening Um, but still like growing my own vegetables is so important, but a lot of people don't know where to start. No. And I think that's where education is so important and, uh, you know, learning how to do these things. So people are afraid to can because they think they're going to die of botulism or something, right? Oh, if I do this wrong, I'm going to die. Uh, probably not, (laughs) (laughs) you know, yeah. You know, the, the spinach coming from, uh, you know, California could be just as bad for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. take your risk and do it yourself. So with all of this, uh, you talked about the products that you offer. Where can people find you? How can they get these products and how can they taste the stuff that you, uh, you grow? Well, um, right now, I mean, uh, our store is located, we have a little shop that's located on Fifth Line Mono, just north of Five Side Road. Um, and if you went to our um, website, it would give you directions. So ambrayfarm.com, or you could do Google Maps and type in Ambray Farm, and it will more or less get you to the right spot. Um, just don't come up from the valley. <laughs> that road's a little rough. <laughs> Sometimes some of the GPS will, will send, us, send you that way. But yeah, it's, it's seasonably uh, reached. Um, we're, we're about 15 minutes out of Orangeville and uh, we have customers coming from Caledon, Alston, uh, uh, Orangeville, um, and a lot come from Toronto and Brampton actually. So that's one of the ways to uh, coming buy the food and we're open daily. Um, the other places that you can buy that, that is, for example, the, the Hockley General Store will carry some of our products. So if you're kind of in a pinch and you're there, you can usually pick up uh, some, some of the products there. Uh, the Birch Shop is a really exciting little new venture. I don't know if anybody knows about it, but it's taking a, a, a group of people who um, have some uh, developmental delays type issues and created a great spot where you can buy local food. And so the, the people who are in the program are actually running the store and they're sourcing stuff from all us local uh, producers. So, you know, you can pop in there and Palgrave at the old post office and they turned that into a little local um, spot and it's great because it's supporting these, uh, uh, supporting these, these, these adults who, um, you know, uh, couldn't find work otherwise. And so this gives them a, a good meaningful experience for their life. Um, so you can go there to buy it. Um, and then any one of the restaurants you know, that we, we, we sell to, you can get the food that way made by a chef. So um, um, Forage is one of our customers. Um, the Black Birch Restaurant is one of our customers. I don't want to forget anybody. Hockley, Hockley General Store has their own kitchen too. Um, I'm now really forgetting people. Um, <laughs> rest- yeah, you, rest- rest- rustic in the Globe as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Globe right now is is open per se, but but anyways, yes. So those are some of the places. So you can check out any of those restaurants, and boy, do they need need you to call up for a takeout order. 
Yes, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jamie. It's been a pleasure having you on here. Um, before we sign off, is there anything that you want to add? Um, well, I guess I want to say thanks, I guess, to the Compass Run for what they do to, to the community. Um, I think they had 800 people the last time it was run live. Dave could probably tell me for sure the numbers you had. Do you remember? Was it 800 or something? Uh, you're just shy of a thousand for our last live event. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. you think about, you know, a community of, you know, 30,000 people and you're drawing from outside of our community too, obviously. That's a pretty big, substantial event. And I think you guys have done an amazing job pulling this off. Um, and you, you brought a lot of young people um into running actually um if you talk to the high school coaches they've never had so many good runners um walking in their doors in years and it's primarily because of the school program like where the kids race for their school and you know just love it just love the having the kids doing it and the kids are running for food for their classmates like man that's powerful that's really yeah. powerful and so you know i just kind of yeah, I tear up when I think about what you guys have done with your, with that race. Um, you know, it's almost to the point, probably it's too big, <laughs> but you'll have to stagger it out a little bit or, but you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how to do it. I know you will, but yeah, a, th a thousand, a thousand people running the Island Lake trail and, and some of them are only uh, three feet tall. You gotta be careful. You don't, you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't kill them. <laughs> yeah. But it's a lot of fun to see, see the, the breadth of humanity that shows up the kids the serious type runners, the walkers, the people that run just for fun and fitness, and they're all sizes and shapes, and it doesn't really matter. It takes them all, it takes everybody in. So you want to see what the real world looks like, just go to the community the, the day of the races. And that's a pretty good snapshot of, of the Orangeville community. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure, and I am so excited to come tour your farm um yep. and i can't wait for everything to open up again so that we can all do those educational seminars there well i hope so yeah and uh, and you guys are always welcome and uh um we do have days where we actually have organized tours so um people can always just email me and we'll set up a day and we we take 10 or 12 people through at once is a little more you know if you want to learn something it will take you through a, a tour and we'll include your website and links or links to your website as well. So sure. yeah, Great. I'm so excited uh, from talking to you. I feel like going to dig in my little backyard garden and add some carbon and bacteria in there. No chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't go wrong by putting, putting carbon in. Okay, so we chatted and defined our personal SMART goals in the last podcast. So today, let's talk about the barriers that we may encounter and troubleshoot on how to overcome that barrier. Um, so David, can you tell us a little bit about some of the barriers that you have encountered um, with your goal or if you've encountered any? Uh, yeah, I think for me, um, I'm my own uh, kind of difficulty, uh, not myself personally, but the, the disease that I'm working with is a uh, type one diabetic. So sometimes, uh, going on a, going on a walk where your blood sugar is low, you have to cut it a little bit short and, you know, turn, turn left a little bit earlier than you wanted. Um, maybe when your blood sugar is too low before you head out, uh, making sure that you prep accordingly uh, to go. So that's been a couple of times where, you know, we're ready to go. And I was just like, Oh, maybe in 15 minutes, I just, I need to have a snack need to head out, um, prepare myself mentally and physically to get over that challenge, uh, to be able to go and tackle a couple of kilometers, uh, each and every night. Dave, can you just remind us of your goal again? Yeah. So my goal is to walk a thousand kilometers before, uh, January or sorry, December 31st. And I happen to know you're doing really well. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing pretty good. We just got some, uh, some new shoes for the trail. So we both, uh, got some new, shoes delivered and we're super excited to use those uh on the more technical trails rather than just the roads that we've been uh, able to do right now have you worn them yet uh, around the house that's about it yeah we're trying to respect uh the distance and try and stay home when we can so yeah so uh just just want to uh do a quick recap and uh, how are things going with your goal so for my goal so i kind of stated that i um, while I was diagnosed with ref acid reflux, I really don't want to rely on pills 
Um, I want to try to heal as naturally as I can with nutrition and um, considering my diet, what does and doesn't trigger um, acid reflux. So that is where I was last episode. Um, I've really come pretty far in the last week or week, week and a bit. Um, but I did have a follow up with my doctor and she's kind of thinking that it might be something in addition to reflux. So with any digestive disorder, I don't think that the healing process is linear. It's kind of a wave and until you figure out what actually is causing issues. Um, so she's suggested that I consider a low FODMAP diet in addition to um, acid reflux. I think that's how you say it, low FODMAP. It's like low F-O-D-M-A-P. Um, so it's basically um, kind of taking out a lot of fermentable carbs, basically. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as my barriers anyways, I think one of the biggest barriers is really figuring out what those triggers are. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, it's not a linear process. So just coming into realization that there are going to be good days, there's going to be bad days. Um, one of the biggest personal barriers is that I'm a very social, I'm very social when it comes to food and drink. Um, not being able to enjoy an alcoholic beverage on the weekend is, is really tough, for, but um, I know that if I do ha consume one or, you know, consume a nice steak or ribs that I'm going to feel terrible the next day or even that night. So um, just sticking, to, sticking to the diet, sticking to writing down um, what I eat, keeping that food journal um, and finding those amazing recipes. So if I can stick to it, I'm golden, but there's definitely some barriers that I am coming across. So I think maybe for you, the hardest part is trying to figure it out. So uh, maybe how would you find going through this struggle of the learning curve and how do you, how are you going to stay motivated through that? So I think the, the biggest motivation factor, and I think it's when, when anyone is doing a diet, it's what they're doing the diet for, for me, it's for healing and for my health. It's not to lose weight or, you know, more aesthetic reasons. So for me, if I eat something that doesn't agree with, or my body doesn't agree with, I'm going to feel the consequences. So it's, it's motivating knowing that if I eat the way that I should be eating and eat all those good foods, um, so that I can heal my gut that I'm going to feel good. So that is a huge motivating factor is just to feel, um, healthy without any symptoms. That's really good. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's definitely, you know, downfalls, like one day out, I will feel great. And I'm like, Oh, I'm going to have some chips or whatever. And then, you know, symptoms rush right back. So I'm um, just sticking, sticking to it. And uh, I think that writing down what I'm eating definitely, definitely helps. And Jackie, uh, how do you think uh, there are some barriers coming to achieve your goal? So my goal is to, ro to run a 50K on September 18th. Um, my barriers will be uh, twofold. One will be injury wise and the other one's psychological. Um, and injury, I am prone to some injuries. You know, I have a great therapist, um, so she's gonna help me. And uh, so I'm trying to navigate that. I've set up a training program, so I think that's gonna help. And uh, psychological, it's the motivation. And I tend to give up. Um, and so for me, it's that block of, oh, I see a hill, I'm going to give up versus, you know, that kind of, okay, I'm going to put my head down and it's one step at a time, one step at a time. So that's kind of how my hope is that I manage those barriers my husband and I talk about, we have a good guy and we have Bob that sits on our shoulders. And Bob is constantly telling us, you suck. You shouldn't be doing this. You need to stop. And so I need to do this to Bob lots and <laughs> remind myself that Bob just is in my head. So in future episodes, if we hear you talking poorly about a, someone named Bob, that that's who we're referring to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I have faith that we could all conquer our goals. Um, we can push through those barriers and we can do it together. Um, yes. So 
Until next time. We'll talk food. We'll talk fitness. And we'll do it together. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Food and Fitness Podcast. Tune in to our next episode where we sit down with Kiana and tips and tricks for how to get started with new exercise routines, how to stay motivated, and keep physical.